skydiving began before it was a sport. Skydiving was initially uh, for pilots whose aircraft were no longer functioning properly. Uh, the earliest uh, parachutists were, uh, I guess you could say, involuntary. Um, the, the parachutes uh, used by the earliest aviators were made of silk. The canopy itself was made of silk. And the harness, as this one here, uh, made in 1941, uh, is actually made from cotton. Now, this particular parachute system is, uh, is something left over from World War II. This was used by the Tuskegee Airmen, actually. Um, and so this system is a seat pack. There is no reserve parachute. Uh, from a certain perspective, this is the reserve parachute because the primary parachute was the airplane. So if that didn't work, this was the only way to go. And if you really take a closer look at these, these early systems, uh, they're not that different from what we use today. Uh, the fabrics have improved, and of course the aerodynamics uh, are something that we, we understand quite a bit more about now, and so we can make them land softer. But uh, the truth is that this is not very much different from what I did my first jump on. So after a while, people decided that if they were going to jump out of an airplane voluntarily, they wanted to have two parachutes. And so we had this idea that it should either be you know, on the, on the butt, the seat pack, or on the back. And we added the second parachute onto the belly. It just seemed like the logical thing to do. Uh, and so we had a main ripcord and a reserve ripcord. We had cutaways. Uh, in those days, we had a, a few different options of how to release the parachute. But in most cases, we were taught these are for not to touch. So we would not release the main parachute in the event of a malfunction. We would go ahead and just fire that reserve. If it was a low speed, we would actually have to throw the parachute. And if you happen to be spinning, they say throw it in the direction of the spin so it doesn't wrap around your body. Well, <laughs> this, uh, <laughs> this thing would work in most cases just, just fine, but sometimes it needed a little bit of help. Uh, in a high speed malfunction as I had on my third jump, uh, you might have to pull the ripcord and then hit the thing to knock it open, which is exactly what I had to do, but it saved my life. It worked. So uh, although they, these systems might be ugly, they are fully functional, and the sport of skydiving would not exist without this phase of evolution, the round parachute days with the belly mount reserves. Might be ugly, but it will save your life. So the next phase in skydiving was way more cool. We had parachutes on our back. There was nothing on our belly anymore. Uh, and the parachutes were becoming more high performance. We had gliding parachutes, square canopies as we called them back in those days. Uh, originally designed by Domina Jalbert, a Florida kite designer. Uh, these inflatable wings could glide at a two to one glide ratio and we could go for miles. So we would land on the target a lot more often with systems like this. And we had this wonderful new invention called the three ring or the three ring circus, which allowed for an easy release of the, the parachute with only one handle. So we could jettison that canopy and fire the reserve in one quick sequence. So that was quite a thing. The next uh, step also along the way here was something called a throwout pilot chute. Now, the rip cords of the old days were something that we, we really didn't, uh, didn't want to keep around because rip cords have a spring-loaded pilot chute that may jump away from you and might get stuck in the turbulence behind your back, what we call your burble. And so in the burble, the parachute will simply not open and you have to try to dip a shoulder and now there's risk of, of instability during the deployment sequence. And so this throw out pilot chute was a big step forward. The earliest were worn on a belly strap. And the, the problem with a belly band we discovered is that it's really easy to twist them by accident. And if you've got a twisted belly band, now you can't have, uh, you won't have access to it or it will not deploy at all. You'll have what we call a pilot chute in tow. So you'll be trailing the pilot chute behind you. Uh, and most people didn't have automatic activa activation devices in those days. 
uh, that was something for, for students. You know? So the experienced skydivers uh, wouldn't even jump with you if you had uh, an automatic activation device. Of course, back in those days, we called them AODs, automatic opening devices. Um, so you know, it was number one, number two, number three, and if that sequence didn't work, well, see you next lifetime <laughs> because you don't have any more options. Uh, these systems were very large. They're incredibly uncomfortable, uh, but compared to the belly mount reserve uh, systems, this was much better. And sitting in the airplane with your knees up to your chest, you don't have this big thing squeezing on your belly, and so you can breathe better. And that alone was a huge step forward for the sport. The big floppy jumpsuits came at about the same time, and that was to delay our descent so we could actually fall slower. We get a longer, uh, longer free fall before pulling. We would delay the pull. And uh, by having a little more drag on our bodies, so we believed, we could have more maneuverability. And so these uh, floppy jumpsuits had several downsides. One is they're very hot and sweaty on a warm summer day, and it's very hard to climb out of the airplane when you have this much drag on you. Uh, and many of the exits of the, for formation skydiving involve climbing partially out of the aircraft before leaving. This was quite a challenge with the big suits I discovered back in the 80s. Uh, so we've gotten rid of the big floppy suits. However, the tandem systems, as we called them back in those days, one above the other, two parachutes in the same place on your back in tandem, uh, some people called them a piggyback or a pig rig. This was a massive leap forward towards today's sport of skydiving. Modern parachute systems have come an awfully long way since the mid 80s, and they have allowed for lots of different kinds of people to engage in this sport because the size of the parachute system, the consistency with which they work, the weight, and the comfort of these systems is really uh, it's reached an acceptable level where most people can do it, which is why the sport has spread so widely and we've got more than three million jumps being made every single year and over 10 million people in the US alone who have said, hey, I've made a parachute jump, I'm a skydiver. The sport of skydiving has changed a lot in terms of the equipment, but the people that engage in this beautiful experience have not really changed that much since the earliest days. The, the safety has improved and, and for certain that has attracted a wider group of people. Uh, but nevertheless, the, the core of the aeronaut, the, the core of the parachute jumper is still the same. Uh, we're a fun-loving bunch of people that, that don't want to get hurt. We don't want to die despite the uh, perception perhaps uh, of the public. And uh, the reason why we do this is because it's fun. That's really what it comes down to. So we will continue to evolve as, uh, as a branch of aviation. We will continue to pursue both safety and expansion of what is possible up there. And uh, with a little creativity, uh, I think there's really not much limit to where this sport will go. I'm Brian Germain. Thank you for joining us.
Brian Germain. Welcome to First Skydive. What to know before you go. Let's go to the classroom. Hello, I'm Brian Germain, and that's a really loud airplane noise in the background. <laughs> I can do anything. 